lot of you know I grew up in Malawi, East Africa, and growing up as a young boy there, uh, most of my cousins lived there as well, and after school a lot of days, we'd try to hitch a ride to the golf course before dinner and get nine holes in. And I remember one of these afternoons, we got a ride to the golf course and we're playing, and we would have caddies with us carrying our clubs, and one of the caddies, Christoph, who was always with us, he looked at me and he said, Byron, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I, I said, Christoph. I don't know, maybe a professional golfer like Tiger Woods. And he said, no, 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 Byron, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, Christoph, I, I don't know. Maybe on the PGA Tour like Tiger Woods, I think. And he said, Byron, Byron, what do you dream of being? You're an American boy. You're from America. If you dream of being it, you can be it. If you dream of being the president of the United States, you can be the president of the United States. Those words, ever since I was 10 years old, have stayed with me and impacted me and have had such a profound uh, meaning on what I do now. Now I try to make an impact every single day. I try to set higher dreams and higher goals for my life because of those words from Christoph, a caddy in the third world, who knew that each of us have a dream. Right now we're going through a series, and the series is called Unstoppable. But as I think about 2020, the year that thankfully just ended, most of it was stopping, wasn't it? Our church stopped, and our school stopped, and our economy, and our jobs, for a lot of us, they stopped overnight. And we quickly saw, and then we were shocked, at how fast everything could just come to a halt and stop. But here's the thing that I'm most afraid of, I think, as I see all this stopping. I'm afraid that in 2020, a lot of us are going to take our dreams and take those things that God has put deep down inside of us, and we're going to put our dreams on hold. We're going to put our dreams on layaway for later and say, I can't accomplish that anymore. And this morning, you're here, I believe, for a reason, because God has told me to tell you one thing, if you remember one thing, and it's this. Don't let your dreams die. And we need to breathe some energy into 2021 a little bit. So I want you to look at someone and say, don't let your dreams die. A little louder. Don't let your dreams die. Look at the second person you chose. And if you're at home, say it to your dog if you're alone. Say, don't let your dreams die. When I think about dreamers, I think about Joseph in the Bible. Joseph was a young man. He's 17 years old. And a lot of us know that Joseph is called what? He's called the king of dreams, isn't he? Because God gave Joseph two dreams, almost visions, very lucid dreams. And we have this in, in Genesis 37, that's our text for the morning, we read about Joseph's dreams. Verse 5, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him. These guys are savages. All the more, they already hated him. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you've had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Something we should understand about dreams, especially these nighttime dreams that Joseph has, is dreams were much more significant in the ancient Near Eastern world than they are today. There would be people who were dream interpreters. If you had a dream, it might mean it was something about your future or about your family. And so Joseph has this dream, this nighttime dream, and he can't stop thinking about it. He's a young 17-year-old guy, and all of a sudden, if we know 17-year-old boys, he's told that people are going to bow down to him, that maybe the world is going to bow down to him. And Joseph is like, yeah, let's speed this process up a little bit. You know, I, I knew I was great, but I didn't know I was this great. So yeah, kiss the ring. Let's, let's speed this up. Let's make it happen. All right, start bowing. But that's not how Joseph's story goes. A lot of you who have grown up in church or who have seen Joseph's story, and a little spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you what happens. Joseph's story is one of, of hardship and trials and pits and prisons. It's a journey he probably didn't see coming at all in the slightest. But what happens in the end with Joseph's story? Joseph sees success, and he successfully accomplishes those dreams much, much more than he ever thought. God gives him even more than those dreams. 
I think when we look at Joseph and we look at any successful people in our world today or in history, I think there are a few secrets that they have, something that they do to accomplish their dreams that some of us may not know about. And as we start to study Joseph's story, there are these three secrets that I'm going to show you to pursue your dreams because maybe you're ready to pursue your dreams again. And I think I'm going to help you out this morning. So we're going to start out with the first secret to pursuing your dreams. And the first secret is this. You have to begin to speak your dream audibly, out loud. I'd even say, say it loud. Speaking your dream audibly is critical. Do you know what made Joseph so unstoppable in his life? I'll give you a hint. It wasn't the colorful jacket that his dad had made for him. That actually was probably part of his demise. I think a lot of times in our life, we get, you know, fancy clothes. We start to get a nice car. We, we, maybe some of us can't afford. And we start going, yes, now I'm getting the promotion. Now that they see me, look how good this fit is fire. I, now I'm going to be the boss here. Dressing for success is part of it. And I'm not saying don't because I think that there's a mental part of dressing for success. But the main secret that Joseph knows is he begins to speak it out loud. He has this dream. He's 17, and he probably walks out to his parents, and he's like, Mom, do you know this dream that I just had? Let me tell you about it. It was nuts. You guys were bowing down. Dad, do you know? Dad, you were bowing down too. Hey, brothers, do you know about my dream? And this was his mistake. You know, you guys were bowing down. And he starts, he can't stop talking about it and speaking this dream out loud. A lot of us, as we're, as we're processing this idea of dreams this morning, and maybe you're sitting here, maybe you're thinking, that's nice, but I, I don't really know if I have a dream. I don't know what my purpose is. And I'd really encourage you, as you sit here this morning, to start processing, what is my dream? What is that thing from years ago that God put deep down inside of you that you feel comes up over and over again, that you can't get rid of? I feel like that's your God-given purpose, your God-given dream. And maybe for some of you, it's to go on. Maybe you're young and God wants you to go and be the leader of a, a, five, a Fortune 500 company and to impact the world for God and business. Maybe for some of you, you have a dream of going and, and starting homeless shelters in the world's poorest cities and helping the least of these for God's kingdom. Maybe for some of you, you want to be a pro marathoner and run the gospel around the world and not just make your name famous, but make his name famous. Maybe you're like my friend Mark who I know at the gym, and I see him there often. And Mark is a grandfather. But Mark told me this week that his dream is to write songs and beautiful melodies to encourage people. See, no matter what age you are, no matter what stage of life you're in, no matter your health condition, God's put a unique dream inside each and every person in this room and around the world. And he's saying, I'm waiting for you to live it out. I'm waiting for you to begin speaking that dream of your life into existence. But what's the hardest part about that? I think there's a really big road bump that we come to. I think a lot of us come to this part in the dreaming process, and we start to hear, stop. Stop. Who are you? You? You can't even pay rent on time. You? You can't even function in a Zoom meeting right now. God, you you have this dream. You will never. You dropped out of school. It's taken you this long to finish this much school. You don't even have a degree. So who are you? No. I think Satan is the one who comes and steals our dreams from us. He's the thief in the night, and he also wants to be the thief of the dream that God has put inside of you. In the Psalms, we read this amazing verse. It's in Psalms 37.4. And it says, God wants to give you the desires of your heart. God has a plan and a purpose for you. And he also desires to give you the desires that have been placed in your heart, maybe since you were a young child. He wants to see you and your family and your relationship prosper. He wants to see this dream come to fruition. He wants you to start speaking about this dream and talking about this dream. I think a lot of us in 2020... As we talk about dreams, we can't stop thinking about what we're in, and it's a pandemic, and it's been discouraging for most of us. And I look out and I see masks, and it's been very hard for a lot of us, hasn't it? It's been a year of lies. It's been a year, I know for a lot of families that are around us at church right now, a lot of my friends, a year of loss. Maybe it's been a year of letdowns. I know a lot of people close to me and my family that have lost jobs. And so maybe for you, your heart has become filled with this discouragement, maybe even some slight depression, if you're being honest. 
and you don't know how you could move forward with a dream if you can't move forward with your mental health. I think we have two options, though. Your first option is to begin dwelling on that discouragement, dwelling on those losses, dwelling on the pessimism and the negativity that's been in your mind and in your house, and begin speaking that as your future and speaking that as your dream and speaking that over your kids, or you have a second option. Your other option is to begin to dwell on that dream that God put inside of you and dwell on that optimistic success and begin speaking this over your future and begin speaking the positive dream that I am going to accomplish out into my life and begin dwelling on these words from God. I've been thinking about dwelling, and as I think about dwelling, it really is the second secret in finding your dreams and accomplishing your dreams successfully. You can never just speak it out loud. That's one part of the process. But if you want to know the secret, the secret is to dwell on that dream, to almost obsess over that dream in a healthy way. I've heard uh, Denzel Washington's story, and I don't know if you know Denzel, but maybe you could watch a movie and you'll find out who he is. So he's telling his story, and Denzel said he had just flunked out of college. He flunks out of school, and he goes home, and he's sitting in his mom's beauty salon. And as he's sitting there, he's leaning back, and this lady, she won't stop staring at him. She won't stop staring at him. And finally, she won't stop staring at him, so Denzel looks at her, and she walks over, gets up, and says, young man, I have a vision and a dream over your life. And Denzel said that this lady was known for prophecies and visions at their church. And she went on to say, young man, I've got a vision over your life and a prophecy for you. You're going to go and teach to millions around the world and preach to millions around the world. You'll travel around the world and your name will be famous. And then she grabs a blue envelope and she writes that vision on the blue envelope and hands it to Denzel. Denzel has two options at this point in his life. He comes to a fork in the road. He can either walk out of that beauty salon, take that envelope, stuff it in his pocket, and go, my mom's church friends are just insane. They're crazy. What are they talking about? I shouldn't have gone there in the first place. And it could have been another Tuesday for him, right? But he doesn't. Denzel starts looking at that blue envelope. He starts looking back at her words. He starts looking about the dream that she had just spoken over his life. And I think Denzel, I think he started walking a little bit different that day. I think he started going, you know what? Now that she mentions it, I do kind of walk like a, I do walk like a star. Now that she mentions it, I do even kind of talk like a movie star. Hey, who's that good looking guy? Now that she mentions it, I even do look like a movie star. Denzel, when he's talking about his story, he has a quote. And he says this, he says, this was supposed to be my life. She called it. He goes on to say that she gave him direction. She gave him determination to go and accomplish a dream that he had never realized was his dream. He now is moving with direction and dwelling on those words. And I know some of you in this room, you're like, that's nice. Well, he's famous, and I I don't know. I can't even figure my life out right now. I don't know how dwelling on this thing is actually going to help me accomplish this thing. And I want to get you there. I'm going to move us all there right now. I think as we go back to the Bible and we go back and look at Joseph's story, Joseph was a young man as well. And he has this dream and he's, he's speaking about it, isn't he? But then he's also dwelling on it. He becomes obsessed with it, I think. I think it's probably all he could think about, maybe because it's all he had now that he's living in a foreign country as a slave. So he's obsessing over this dream and what ends up happening? Well, If we go to Genesis 39, we know that he's living in Potiphar's house, and one of the real housewives of Egypt is going to start coming after him and pursuing him, and this is no good for him. And so what does it say in Genesis 39? It says this. It says, now Joseph was well-built and handsome. He looks like Zac Efron. He's a young, good-looking, really good-looking movie star type guy. And it actually only says this twice in the Bible about people, that someone was good-looking, and it says this about Joseph. So he must have been incredibly good-looking. It's a side note. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But Joseph refused. What happened in the story? What happens right there in that moment? Nothing. Nothing. I think as we start to study that moment, nothing happens because there's no secret affair. There's no sin. 
There's no provocative adultery that's hidden that could be written about in some weird novel. No, that doesn't happen because Joseph looks at this woman. I I believe Joseph is standing there with this housewife and he goes, you know what? No, you are so insignificant in the grand scheme of my life. I'm not going to let you, you might be significant in society, you might be significant with your friends, but you are significant in my dreams and what I'm trying to accomplish right now. And you're getting in the way of me and my goals and my dreams. I've been thinking about what stops us and what's unstoppable. And I was thinking about unstoppable forces in the world. And I kept coming back to the idea of trains. Trains, they're pretty unstoppable, aren't they? They move with such force and and velocity and speed. And I don't want my, you know, we never want our cars to get near them because that'll be the end of you, won't it? So I'm, I'm really dwelling and obsessing over these trains being unstoppable, and I think I need to know more about trains. And thankfully, I have the phone number for Mr. Vern Vandaloo. He owns one of the largest railroad companies in America. And I said, I'm calling Mr. Vern Vandaloo. And I called him, and I said, Mr. Vandaloo, I need to know about trains. Specifically, what can derail a train? And so we're on the phone, and he said, that's actually a really interesting question. He said, there are about two things that could derail a train. He said, but one thing really, he said, train tracks, most people don't know this, are about 56 and a half inches apart. Exactly. That means the train tracks are in gauge. If the train tracks are even a millimeter closer or a centimeter further apart, that means that the train tracks are out of gauge. And then he said, once the train starts coming towards that part in the railroad track, if the railroad track's out of gauge, once it hits the out of gauge section, it'll throw the train. It'll completely derail the train. And then he said something fascinating. He said, not only is it going to derail the first car and throw it, but the second, the third, and every other car after that are going to be derailed and maybe blown up completely. I was thinking about that in our lives, and I was thinking each person in this room, no matter how old or young you are, where you're at in your career, our lives are just like that train. The smallest, most insignificant thing that we may not see coming can stop us, stop us from our dreams, and it can totally derail not just one section of your life, not just your work, not just your marriage, but it can derail everything if you're not careful. And I want to ask you this morning, because 2020 has been an insane year. We're going to keep saying that for history. But maybe you've let in some people. Maybe you've become friends with people that maybe you're thinking about them right now, and maybe you shouldn't be friends with them anymore. Maybe you've started going to a place. Maybe I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a restaurant, and maybe you shouldn't be going there anymore. Or maybe it's a habit. In 2020, we all started forming new habits. Maybe you have a bad habit, and that habit is going to derail your life. And it's going to derail your dreams if you're not careful. What what is it in your life that could possibly seem insignificant in this moment? Maybe you're saying it's not that bad. He doesn't know. It's not that bad. It's really not going to affect me. But if you're not careful, that thing will start to derail you and ruin everything. As as we're on the the topic of, of dreams and pursuing those dreams, I think we start to sometimes get discouraged because maybe you're on that track and you've been on it for a while and maybe you've gone full speed ahead like a train. But you look and, and you're thinking, my dream is so far off in the distance. Those goals I made, I haven't even hit one of them. And it's been years. And we start to get discouraged. Maybe we start to give up and our dreams, some of them start to fade away until you're sitting here and you don't know what that dream is anymore. I, I think we also start to say things like, you know, 2021 is, is going to be a great year, but 2020 was such a bad year and took such a toll on my marriage and it took a toll on me financially that I'm not in the place. This dream stuff, it's great. Don't get me wrong. It's good. But I'm not in the place, even mentally, my mental health is not good, and I just, I can't. 2022, that's my year. 2023, I'll really start pursuing dreams. And 2025, I'll accomplish those dreams. Here's the thing about every successful person in history, the successful people around you, and the thing about Joseph. His secret was that he never made excuses. Successful people will never make an excuse, no matter the situation. No matter the problem, I think a lot of times we say, you just don't know my family background. 
You don't know what I've been through. I, this is just the way I am. This is why I can't accomplish these things. Or we say things like, my parents are divorced. Or my father, he was an alcoholic. Or I was abused, and that's why I can't. That's why I can't make progress. And I'm sorry about all of those things that have happened to you in your past. But here's the thing about excuses. If you make excuse after excuse after excuse year after year, you're going to end up with a life filled with excuses, but a life empty of dreams, aren't you? I think we go back and we look at Joseph's story in the Bible where, where God gave him a dream. Joseph had every opportunity to start making a laundry list of excuses, saying, you don't know. I mean, my brothers, they abused me. They tried to, you know, even kill me at one point. And then they sold me into slavery. My father, in a way, he abandoned me. I, I'm in prison now. You don't, you don't even know. I, I ended up in prison for a crime I didn't do. But as we look at Joseph's story, what does he do? He doesn't make excuses because he knows the longer he makes excuses the longer his dreams will be put on hold, possibly forever. So he decides in that moment, I believe, to continue dwelling on that dream and to say, I'm not going to make excuses. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to keep moving forward. I don't know what to do, but I'm going to do the next right thing. I'm not sure why God has placed me here. This isn't the means by which I would have gotten here. I wouldn't have taken this railroad track. I wouldn't have been on this Google Maps path. would have taken a much easier journey. But he doesn't make excuses, and he keeps working. And I think it's like that for all of us. Maybe God has taken you on a means that you would have never chosen for you or for your family. And you're sitting there going, this is definitely not the track that I thought I'd be on. You can either keep making excuses and keep putting things on pause and keep waiting and putting your dreams on hold forever, or you can move forward on the track that God has put you on. I, I want to go ahead and I want to close with this story that I read. This is called Jimmy's Story. It started like so many evenings, mom and dad at home and Jimmy playing after dinner. Mom and dad were absorbed with their jobs and didn't notice the time. It was a full moon and some of the light had seeped in through the windows. Then mom glanced back at the clock. Jimmy, it's time to go to bed. Go up now and I'll come settle you in later. Unlike usual, Jimmy went straight upstairs to his room. An hour or so later, his mother came up to check if all was well, and to her astonishment, found that her son was staring quietly out of his window at the moonlit scenery. What are you doing, Jimmy? I'm looking at the moon, Mommy. Well, it's time to go to bed now. As this reluctant boy settled down, he said, Mommy, you know, one day I'm going to walk on that moon. As Jimmy got older, his dream never went away. He rode a motorcycle everywhere he went, and one day his dreams were nearly shattered as he was in an accident that left almost every bone in his body broken. But Jimmy's dream still remained unbroken. He fought through rehab and surgeries as he worked to get his body back into shape. And 32 years later, Jimmy's dream became a reality when James Jimmy Irwin stepped on the moon's surface. He was one of only 12 to ever do so. No matter what happens to you, no matter where you're at in your journey, no matter how bleak it might seem, no matter how impossible your dreams might seem, my challenge to you, just like Joseph, is to never give up. When we look at Joseph's life, Joseph was a man who never gave up on his dreams. And we see this play out beautifully at the end of Joseph's story. Joseph is standing over Egypt. He's now the prince of Egypt. People have bowed down to him, but God's given him so much more. God now has given him sons, and he's standing there with his father and with his grandchildren. And it says this at the end of the story. Joseph brought his sons close to him, and his father kissed them and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, and now God has allowed me to see your children too. And God gave them 17 more years together. Right now, maybe your dreams seem possible, but here's what I want you to do. I want to challenge you to never give up on those dreams, whatever that is that God's put inside your heart. And I want all of you to pull your phone out right now. It's 2021. Oh, I'm going to wait because I want you to pull your phones out. 
If you're at home, pull it out. If you have a pen, write this down. And I'm going to wait because this is critical to your future. I want you to write, put it in your notes where you're going to see it. My dream is, and fill in the blank. You can fill it in later if you're not sure about what it is. Maybe you need a day to think about it or two days to pray about it, but don't let it last any longer. I want you to fill that in and put my dream is, and I want you to take that. Maybe go put it on a sticky note and go put it up in your bathroom mirror. Or maybe go put it in your car where you're gonna see it when you have to go every morning and start reading that and start speaking that out loud to yourself in the car or in the bathroom and say, my dream is. My dream is and it's coming true. My dream is and I'm working towards it. My dream is and it's gonna happen very, very soon. Because don't, don't just speak the dream, but believe that your God, the God of the universe, the God of Joseph, is big enough to turn those dreams from not just a dream, but into your reality. I hope you believe that this morning, that our God is a big God, one of God's sized dreams.